house lights up too, please? I'm a teacher and I like to see whether people are uh, texting. <laughs> right? Everyone paying attention? Okay. Thank you very much for having me he here today. I am really, um, I don't know, I, I feel incredibly honored to be with such distinguished people and I hope that uh, what I'm going to be telling you about reading is going to be helpful. Uh, so we'll start. Now let me just see my timing. Yes, there I go. 1936. Oh, right, that's my time. Oh, whoops, sorry. Okay, here we go. Why read? Well, louder. Why read them? What's the point? Isn't print dead? That's what everybody's telling us. And here is one of the usual suspects. TV, the digital media, all the things that are attracting our students now, and indeed ourselves, are killing books. They're killing them books. Dead, dead, dead. But there is another secret assassin. And guess what? You're in this room. Because this is what we do as teachers. This is what we particularly do as English teachers. Because we force people to read. I'm a language and literature teacher back home in the UK. When I'm abroad, I'm a teacher trainer. trainer. And I know that we grind our students' faces into books and make them look for metaphors and similes and interesting use of language, don't we? And we say, no, 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 it's really wonderful. And what about, what about how these participles have been used? Isn't that thrilling? And your students look at you and say, Miss, are you all right? <laughs> so, but there is hope, because we still love stories and books are full of stories. And like my distinguished colleagues ahead of me today have all said, find the story and the teaching is there with, we're teachers, no work at all on our part. Now, isn't that nice? We don't have to stand in front of you, lecturing you and telling you what to do. So, let's think a little bit about what happens when we watch media and we listen. Now, this is not to take away from the wonder of the oral storytelling, because it is an extraordinary thing. But reading is another matter altogether. Certainly, the biggest culprit is the screen and the image, because the minute we start watching the screen, we stop imagining ourselves. Basically, that bit of us cuts out. The pictures are provided. The soundtrack is making us feel sad, or happy, or worried. It's all done for us. Very good storytellers can take us to the Caribbean. And I saw that mango tree. I saw that lady catching fish. I could that story was told so well, it was so alive. It's wonderful. That's the most beautiful thing about a good storyteller. They take you right there to the place. But another thing a storyteller does is by creating such a perfect world, you tend to buy into that world. You listen to the her or his tone of voice, and body language and everything, and you're transported to that world. You don't have to do quite so much work as when you actually have to read the words for yourself in print. Now, as readers, every one of us, every single one of us has, like this little boy's head tries to show, a whole baggage in our head of past experiences, stories we've heard, stories we've been told, um, experiences we've had, places we've seen. All these things live in our mind. And when we open a book, 
we use that knowledge interactively with the book to people it, to create the landscapes, to build the houses, to create the scenes, to relive the emotion of fear or passion or absolute fury. We do that all the time when we read. But if we don't give our students the opportunity to read fluently, to read rapidly, to read for pleasure, as my colleague here was saying earlier today, this extraordinary exchange between the text and the reader never happens. Books remain closed. If you don't read rapidly, if you don't read fluently, if you don't read without thinking about it, like you brush your teeth or you breathe or you walk, nothing happens. It can't happen. And what's more, if you haven't acquired reading for pleasure, that absolute consumption of books that readers who love reading have, you will never be able to really do well in secondary school. A lot of what has gone on today has been about primary school, and that is the foundation on which our students get into secondary school and succeed. But if they're not fluent readers, they just fall behind because there's too much text. They can't do it. So we must make them pleasure readers, people who love text, before they can do anything else. OK? So how does it work? Well, here we are. The reader always calls the shots. So the reader, with his or her interactivity with the book, creates the text creates the pictures in his own mind or her own mind. So let's just have a little practice now. These are three examples of text, but the words are the same, aren't they? They are the beginning of the typical Western tradition of storytelling, once upon a time. And yet, the minute your eyes, because everyone in this room is a reader, you wouldn't be a teacher if you weren't. OK? The minute our eyes fall on these, this text, we start making assumptions. We start planning ahead. The picture here on the right is the one, obviously, that recalls storytelling as we know it. But what about the neon lights? What kind of story lies behind that? Might it be a murder? What about this rather modern black and white one? Perhaps some sort of film noir. What kinds of stories might these be? As readers, we pick up a book and we immediately start making predictions and assumptions about it. I picked these particular titles because they were very similar in a sense because they all show the face of somebody. They all have the as the first word, for example. And yet there are totally different stories behind those pages. And our interactivity, our cognitive interchange with the image, with the text, our predictive abilities that we have through being readers tells us all sorts of things about the story. How many people here have read The Woman in White? Some sad people in the front who are English teachers, I can see. <laughs> OK, it's a wonderful story. It's a man who tries to take all his wife's money by pretending she's dead. And he pretends she's dead in a very skillful way. And that's all I'm going to tell you. OK, The Scarlet Letter is another wonderful story about a woman who has to deal with a terrible situation. She does not want to reveal the father of her child in a society in which it is illegal to have, have an extramarital affair. And the Elephant Man, perhaps some of you have seen the film. What's behind the sack? Another thing we do 
with text is, which we can't do with either so much, with, certainly we can't do with an image, but we can do with, with text, is we can start thinking about how can it be the best of times and the worst of times? This is the opening sentence of A Tale of Two Cities. And, but how could it have been the best of times, the worst? What do we do as readers when we read that? We start thinking of our own best of times, our own worst of times, and thinking how this paradox could be. What happens to us skillful readers is that we fill in the blanks. There is the text, but all the white spaces in between are the story we paint in with our imaginations, with our creativity. And only skillful readers can do that because they've had the practice. They've started as little people being told wonderful stories, being read to. Perhaps they've had exceptional teachers at school who have made storytelling part of it. So they know they have the skills of prediction. What's going to happen next? What kind of word will follow? What happens when that doesn't happen? How do you adjust your expectations? These are all things skillful readers do. How can we make this happen to children who haven't had the advantages of good storytelling? What can we do to help them? We know there is an immense body of research to show that ch children who read are the ones who do best in school and in life. In life, they tend to earn more money and generally do better because they can take on their reading skills with them through life. It's not what we pour into them at school, the date of the French Revolution or whatever, it is the, our capacity to learn as adults. And if we can't give our children that, we don't succeed as teachers. So our absolute duty as teachers is to try and, and help our students become readers. And to do that, there are three incredibly simple rules. Make sure you have books in your classroom. Books to read. Not just the textbook, books to read. Give them choice. Now, the choice is not only of the different genre, type, levels of books. The choice is also not to read, to participate or not to participate, to talk about your reading or not talk about your reading. All these things are very, very important. Choice is central. Ban dictionaries. They're forbidden. For students to become good readers, they must, absolutely must, read at a level that is accessible. That means reading fast without having to think. Because if you have to stop to decode, oh gosh, I have to look that up. By the time you've looked it up and gone back to the text, you've lost interest, you've lost the plot, and it's not fun, it's a chore. It must be read for the story. You must be able to read as if the story were being told to you by a good storyteller, because that's what you become as a good reader. You become the film director of your own story. You're peopling it with the characters you want. You are the hero or heroine of these thrilling things that are happening in the story. But if you have to stop to look up in the word in the dictionary, you sound suddenly less heroic, don't you? Gosh, sorry. Um, hang on there, that sword fight. Yep, 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 yep. Right? OK, so it doesn't work, does it? Because you forget. OK, that's very important. And finally, Make it fun. So if you're using reading in your classroom, not if, when. 
and the when is now, once you start using reading in your classroom, make it fun. My colleague here said the wisest words, when you use reading in your classroom, don't let's have a comprehension exercise after you finish the reading. Say to students, right, who's de what, what have you read today? Why don't, we, why don't you do a, a, a play of it? And you encourage other students who may have read the same book, and they do a mini play for you to tell you about it. Or why don't you make a film about it in your free time? That's what kids who are on the project that we're running in Italy right now are doing. They send by reams these little videos that they put up on YouTube. The other day, I got this amazing video of a six-minute Hamlet done in somebody's garden with these kids fighting with kitchen implements. It was the best thing I'd ever seen. These kids were 14, 15 years old. There was no sense of embarrassment, no sense of shame. And they were saying text from the book. They had adapted it a bit, and it was fantastic. They didn't have a... Um, they didn't have a, um, a Gertrude, so they, they, they dressed up one of the boys as Gertrude. It was fantastic. Ophelia was another boy, and they drowned her in the bath <laughs> with a bunch of flowers. It was brilliant. And that interchange with the text, that, that recreation of a story retold by the reader is the most powerful, powerful learning tool there is. Um, so reading extensively not only ex expands mind, but without any effort on your part. This is the best bit. You just have the books in your classroom and get them reading, and you don't have to do anything else because there's research that shows that if instead of sitting there teaching them grammar, we let them read their books for the hour of the lesson, kids who have just read rather than been taught outperform those who have been taught traditionally outstandingly. And not only that, they keep it for life. Because reading embeds all those structures naturally easily, just in the same way with those songs we were singing. It embeds it because you're reading repeatedly all the time those collocations, what verb tenses you use in certain situations. It's magic, and nobody has to work. Nobody has to memorize anything. Throw that textbook away. Sorry. <laughs> OK? So. Enjoy the freedom of reading on. And I just cannot tell you what a powerful tool a class right library of graded readers is. OK? And if you want to see what graded readers look like, there are some out in the hall. Go to my colleagues at Oxford University Press. They have some, but I think there are other publishers here who have other graded readers. So go for graded readers in your classroom, and let your students read on. If you want to um, know anything more about the project we're running in Italy, which has now been running for almost two years very successfully, that's our website. And you can get download a lot of information about it and how you can get started on your own project. Thank you very much. <laughs>